In today's video, I'm going to do a walkthrough of the math and no calculator section of the May 2021 SAT. I've scored perfectly on back-to-back -back SAT math sections, and as I go through each and every problem, I'm going to show you the most efficient way to solve it. So with all that being said, make sure to like and subscribe, and let's go ahead and get started with question number one. So two lines intersect as shown. What is the value of x? Well, we see we've got vertical angles, and since we have vertical angles, we can go ahead and say that those two angles will equal each other. So we're going to have 5x plus 5 is equal to 7x minus 35. From here, we want to isolate x. So I'm going to always try to keep x positive if I can. So I'm going to subtract 5x from each side to leave me with 2x. Then I'm going to add 35 to each side so I can set my 2x equal to a number. When I add 35 to 5, that's going to leave me with 40. So now I have 40 equals 2x. So to isolate x by itself, i got to divide each side by 2. When I do that, I have 40 over 2, which I know is going to equal 20. I'm asked for the value of x, so my answer is going to be b, 20. All right, moving on to number 2. What is the positive solution to the given equation? So what I'm going to go ahead and do here is I'm going to go ahead and solve by adding 4 to each side, giving me 12 is equal to 2x. From there, I'm going to divide each side by 2. That's going to give me 12 over 2, which will equal 6. Since 6 is a positive solution to the given equation, my answer is going to be C. All right, moving on to number 3. Which of the following is equivalent to 4x cubed plus 8x squared? So in this case, what I'm looking to do is I see I have... 4x squared in each of these terms. So I'm going to try to pull out 4x squared, and then I'm going to have to multiply that by x in order to get my 4x cubed. And then I'll also have to have a plus 2 to give me that plus 8x squared. I look at my answer choices, I see that'll be answer choice C. So my answer for 3 will be C. All right, moving on to number 4 now. If 2n plus 12 is equal to 26n, what is the value of 6n? So right here, I see what I'm looking to do is go ahead and solve or get some ratio where I can get down to a multiple of 6n or just solve for n. So I'm going to go ahead and subtract 2n from each side to isolate my n's on one side. That'll give me 24n is equal to 12. Now from there, what I see is that 6n, if I multiply 6n by 4, that's going to give me that 24n. So therefore, if I divide my 24n by 4, that gives me my 6n. So what I want to do then is divide each side by 4. That's going to give me 3 is equal to 6n. So my answer is going to be C. All right, moving on to number 5. So we've got a quadrilateral, A, B, C, D. It's shown which equation shows how the measures of the angles of the quadrilateral are related. Important thing to know here is that the angles in a quadrilateral must add up to 360. Right? And this makes sense, too, because you could split a quadrilateral like this into two triangles, each of which would have to have their angles add to 180. Therefore, total angles in that quadrilateral must add to 360. Keep in mind, I'm referring to the interior angles. So all we got to do is add all these angles together. So to do that, we're going to have this x plus 90 degrees and then plus that 2x minus 5 and then plus that x plus 35, which we see is going to be answer choice A. So our answer for number 5 will be A. All right, moving on to number 6. We've got a right triangle, ABC. The side length of AC is 12. Measure A is 40, and measure B is a right angle. Which of the following can be determined using the given information? Well, since we know the angle of measure A, and we also know that angle of measure B, which is a right angle, which is 90 degrees, we can go ahead and solve for the measure of C because we know all the angles in a triangle have to add up to 180, and we know two of them. Therefore, we can answer the third. So one is going to be true. We can determine that. Then when we look at two, the length of side AB. Well, we have all of the angles of our triangle, and we also have the length of one side. Therefore, we're going to be able to solve for all of our side lengths as well, so that's also going to be true. So our answer here is going to be C. We can determine both the measure of angle C as well as the length of side AB. All right, moving on to number 7. In the xy plane, line L has a slope of 2. Line K is perpendicular to line L and contains the points 4, 2. Which of the following is an equation of line K? All right, well, line K is going to be perpendicular to line L, which has a slope of 2. Therefore, line K has to have a negative slope and then the reciprocal of 2. The reciprocal of 2 will be 1 over 2. So we know our slope is going to be negative 1 half X. So we can go ahead and write that down in our equation. That's going to get rid of answers A and B. From there, we have to solve for our Y intercept. Now, we know we contain the point 4, 2. Now, if our slope is going down and we want to move from 4 back to 0 on our X axis, then we're going to have to go up, okay? Because we have that negative slope and we're moving to the left, we have to go up, which means we're going to end up going up to that positive 4. We can't go down to 0. So our answer there has to be D for number 7. All right, moving on to number 8. We have a given equation relating the variable C, X, and Y. Which equation correctly expresses Y in terms of X and C? Well, we're going to go ahead and solve for Y then. So all we got to do is multiply each side by Y. Then we got to divide each side by C. And we see then that y is going to equal x over c. So our answer there is going to be d. That one right there is pretty easy. 
All right, moving on to number nine, the function f is a linear function. The y-intercept of the graph y equals f of x in the xy plane is zero and at negative 12. What is the y-intercept of the graph y equals f of x plus two? Well, keep in mind that this y equals f of x, f of x is gonna have that same y-intercept of negative 12. So all we gotta do is add two to that negative 12. And we know that negative 12 plus two is gonna give us negative 10 for our y-intercept. Now keep in mind, our y-intercept is where x equals zero. So right off the bat, we can get rid of c and d. And then we see that obviously our correct answer will be B because it has that negative 10 for that y-intercept. All right, from here we can go ahead and move on to question 10. All right, question 10 says, which of the following is or are an x-intercept of the graph y equals x plus 3 and then x minus 2 over x in the xy plane? One thing to note, in our denominator here, whatever our denominator, we set it equal to 0, okay? So in this case, it's just x, we set that equal to 0. This tells us that our graph is undefined at x okay x means that our domain does not include x equals zero since our domain since our domain does not include x equals zero point three cannot be an x intercept because point three does not exist okay there is no zero and then any y coordinate because zero as an x is not in our domain all right so then moving on from there which of these will be x intercepts between um, option one and option two we see that x plus three tells us that we're going to have an x intercept at x equals negative three and then x minus 2 tells us we're going to have another x-intercept at x equals 2. Because if we were to plug in 2 to this, we'd have 2 minus 2, which would get us 0, thus giving us our x-intercept. Same thing over here. We'd have negative 3 plus 3, which would give us 0, thus giving us our x-intercept. So our answer here is going to be 2 and 1. Those would both be true statements. So our answer is going to be C, okay? 1 and 2 only, not 3, because 3 is not on our domain. Moving on to number 11, the graph of y equals 2 to the power of x minus a is shown where a is a constant. What is the value of a? All right, well, what I want to do here is identify my y-intercept. I see my y-intercept is at negative 3. Next thing I see, I know my y-intercept is when x is 0. We know that 2 to the power of 0 is equal to 1. Any number raised to the power of 0 other than 0, so anything like 1 to the 0 or 4 to the 0 power, will equal one. So any number that's not zero raised to the zero power will equal one. So because of that, I know that I'm gonna have one minus a has to equal my y when x is zero, which we see is negative three. From here, we can go ahead and solve. We know that negative three equal to one minus a. We can go ahead and subtract one from each side, thus leaving us with negative four is equal to a, or equals negative a, I'm sorry, negative four equals negative a. From there, we can go ahead and divide each side by negative one, right, getting rid of that negative sign, getting rid of this negative sign, and we see that a is equal to four. So value of a is gonna be four, which is answer choice a. All right, moving on to number 12. All right, so we've got a graph of body length versus trail tail area. For a certain group of fish, the graph models relationship between body length and tail area a in square centimeters, where s is less than or equal to l, which is less than or equal to 34, which equation represents the relationship between body length and tail area? Key thing to recognize here is that we see throughout the entirety of this graph that our body length is greater than our tail area, which I'm just going to mark as TA for tail area. Now, since our body length is always greater than our tail area, and we look at our answer choices A through D, we see in answer choices B, C, and D that when we square our body length, which is represented by L, we're going to multiply that by a number greater than 1. Well, that right there would be telling us that our area then would have to be greater than our body length, okay? And answer choices B all the way to D, those are all showing that your area, your tail area would have to be greater than your body length, which we know is not true according to this graph. Therefore, our answer has to be A, since that's the only equation that shows us that our body length is going to be greater than our tail area. All right, so moving on to number 13 now. If x, y is the solution to the given system of equations, what's the value of x? So to solve for x, we want to get rid of y. In order to get rid of y, I'm going to multiply my top equation by 3 over 2, or 1 and a half. By doing this and then adding my bottom equation to my top equation, I'm going to be able to get rid of my y's. So we're going to go ahead and do 3 over 2 times 8x. That's going to end up giving us 12x plus 3x. That's going to give us 15x. Next up, we got 3 over 2 times negative 4y. That's going to give us negative 6y plus 6y. Now my y's are gone. Next, I got one and a half times seven. That's going to give me 10 and a half plus 12. 10 and a half plus 12 is going to give me 22 and a half. Okay, 10 and a half plus 12 is going to give me 22 and a half. From here, I can go ahead and divide each side by 15. Divide each side by 15. 
and I see that X will equal 22 and a half over 15, which I know is gonna equal three over two. So my answer here is gonna be A, because I'm asked for the value of X. Always pay close attention to what you're asked to answer with to avoid making a simple mistake. All right, moving on to number 14 now. So we've got options one and two. We have a given system of equations. K is a constant. The system has exactly one solution. That's gonna be a key to answering this. Which of the following could be the value of K? Well, our options here are two or five. If we were to plug in two here, then we'd have the same slope with different y-intercepts. If we ever have on a graph the same slope but different y-intercepts, we're never gonna cross those two lines. So there will never be a solution there. So we can go ahead and get rid of option one because that would be no solution. There would never be any solution at all. And then we look at option two. If we were to put in five, put in five there, we'd have five x plus three, two x plus five, those two lines are gonna cross at one point exactly. Therefore, our answer has to be two only, which is gonna be answer choice B for number 14. All right, moving on to 15. So we have a given function B models the number of flower beetles in a certain area where T represents the number of days after June 1. Which of the following is the best interpretation of the number 1.11 in this context? All right, well, the key thing to understand here is that we are gonna increase by 11% as each day goes on. So at F. On day one, we increase by 11% from 100. Day two, we're going to increase by 11% from whatever it was the previous day. So we have to find an answer choice that says that. So we have option A, the model predicts that there were approximately 1.11 flower beetles in this area on June 1. No, there were 100 on June 1, so we can go ahead and get rid of A. B, the model predicts that the number of flower beetles in this area increases by approximately 1.1 each day. No, it increases by 11% each day, right? It's getting the whole population is multiplying by 1.11 each day. We're not increasing by 1.1 beetles or 1.11 beetles. Option C, the model predicts that it will take approximately 1.11 days for the number of flower beetles to double. No, that's incorrect. If we're going to be dealing with doubling, then in the parentheses right here, and I'll mark it in orange so you can see it better, then in this parentheses, if we're going to talk about doubling, it would be a two there. All right. Next up, we got D. The model predicts that the number of flower beetles grows by a factor of approximately 1.11 each day, and that is 100% correct, okay? Each day, T, as we increase by 1T, we increase by a factor of 1.11, which is also 11%. All right, moving on to number 16. So we are on the free response now. So we have in the XY plane, the graph of Y equals 1 half X plus B, where B is a constant, intersects the X axis at negative 6 and 0, what is the value of b? In this case, we're given our x, we can go ahead and plug that in. We'd have 1 half times negative 6. 1 half times negative 6 is going to end up giving us negative 3. So we'd have y is equal to negative 3 plus b. We know our y is 0, so we can go ahead and plug that in. So we'd have 0 equals negative 3 plus b. In that case, b would have to equal 3. Okay, we're asked for the value of b, which means our answer is going to be 3. So 16, pretty simple there. Now we got 17. We've got for a trip, a car traveled directly away from its starting point at a constant speed. The graph shows the car's distance from its starting point in miles for the trip from times 2.0 hours to two and a half hours after the start of the trip. What was the speed of the car in miles per hour during this trip? A couple things. First off, I just want to point out that you should always, when dealing with a graph, be looking at your intercepts or your scales, right? So where your graph is starting, we can see we're not starting at zero on our X or Y axis. We're starting at two on our X axis, 105 on our Y axis. That's something you always want to pay close attention to because it'll help, it'll help you avoid making silly mistakes. All right, so then from here, what we know is that with a distance versus time graph, the slope is going to be our velocity, right? Or our speed in this case. So let's go ahead and take our speed. If we look right here, okay, at this triangle I just made, as we go over by 0.1 hours, we go up by 5 miles. So our slope then is 5 over 0.1, which is equal to 50 over 1. Okay, so we see then that our we are going up by 50 miles per 1 hour. Therefore, our speed is going to be 50 miles per hour. 50 miles per hour. One thing I do want to add here is that with a distance versus time graph, your slope is going to be your speed. And then with a position versus time graph, your slope is going to be your velocity. That's just one distinction I want to make for 17. All right, moving on to number 18. In the xy plane, the graph of the given equation is a circle. What is the radius of the circle? Key thing here is we need to recognize our equation for the circle. And I'm just going to show you this so that you can have a better understanding of how to solve this problem. Keeping in mind that our center is going to be the point hk. Okay, so our center would be hk. And this is really just showing you this just so that you get a better idea of how to solve this and why it works. So in order to solve this, you need to recognize that you have this minus 8x. In order to get that minus 8x, that means that you have to have x minus 4 squared. 
Now with that, you have to recognize that if you have x minus 4 squared, you're going to end up getting a positive 16. Now that positive 16 we see is not contained in our left side of this equation. Well, that means we had to subtract 16 from each side to get rid of it. So since we had to subtract 16 from each side to get rid of it, and I'm just going to go ahead and show you this, since we had to subtract 16 from each side to get rid of it, we would have to add 16 to our right side in order to put it back in, right? Next up, we see that we've got this minus 10y. In order to get minus 10y, we would have to have y minus 5 squared. Well, minus 5 times minus 5 would give us a plus 25. Now, to get rid of that plus 25 on our left side, since it's not there, we would have had to subtract 25 from each side. So if we had to subtract 25 from each side to get rid of it, we would have had to also subtract 25 from our right side. So we need to add that 25 back in. Okay. Now, when we do that, we see we're going to have 40 plus 16 plus 25. Now, 40 plus 16 is going to uh, end up giving me 56. 56 plus 25 will end up giving me 81. That's going to equal our radius squared. From there, all we got to do is square root each side because we know our radius squared is equal to 81. We take the square root of each side to get our radius, and we see then that our radius is going to equal 9. So the radius of the circle will be 9. All right, moving on to number 19. What is the sum of the solutions to the equation above? All right, well, in this case, I see that I can't factor this out, so what I'm going to have to do is use the quadratic formula. Now, do I care about the b squared minus 4ac value in this case? No. Why don't I care about that value? Well, because that's plus or minus, and when I'm taking the sum of my solutions, I know that those will cancel out because I'll be end up adding that plus b squared minus 4ac, and keep in mind, obviously, that it'll be over 2a, okay? But in this case, since we're going to be also subtracting that same value, we don't have to care about it, right? It really doesn't matter because it's just going to cancel out. So I don't have to pay attention to that. So here's what I'm going to do. All I got to do is take my negative b, put it over 2a, multiply it by 2. That's all I got to do here. So let's go ahead and do that. We have a b value of negative 6. So we'll go negative, negative 6. That's going to give us a positive 6. We see our a value is 1. So we're going to have 6 over 2 times 2, which will give us 6 as the sum of our solutions. So as you can see, by recognizing that you don't need to worry about that plus or minus root b squared, minus 4ac value, right? By realizing you don't have to deal with that, it's going to save you a ton of time. All right, so number 19, answer there is going to be 6. All right, moving on to number 20. In the given expression, a is a constant. The expression is equivalent to x to the power of 6, where x must be positive or equal to 0. What is the value of a? All right, well, we can rewrite the square root of x cubed as x to the power of 3 over 2. Now, from there, we want to raise that to the power of a in order to get x to the power of 6. Well, to do this, we can go ahead and see that we have an x as a base and then an x on a, as our base in both sides of our equation. So we can actually rewrite this as 3 over 2 times a, okay, because if you're raising an exponent to another exponent, you're multiplying them, is equal to 6. From here, we can really easily solve this, right? We're going to go ahead and multiply each side by 2 thirds to isolate a. And when we do that, we see that we will end up with a is equal to 4. Okay, so the value of A will be 4. So 4 is our, is our answer for number 20. Hopefully this video was helpful. If it was, make sure to like and subscribe. In addition to that, if you're looking for private SAT tutoring, college essay editing, or college admissions consulting, be sure to check out my website. The link is in the description. Additionally, if you're gaining value from my content and from my channel, please consider donating. It helps me out a ton and makes it so I can continue to put out these videos for free to help as many people as I can.